We are going to be talking about a concept today called leverage. According to one of the online dictionaries, one of the several definitions is to use something to maximum advantage. Leverage. We use this concept every day. A parent leverages their child's nap, right? You take those somewhere between 10 minutes to three hours, depending on the day, and you get an incredible amount done in that tiny blink of an eye. You leverage that time. Uh, you leverage the fact that you have a very small car and you're able to pull into a parking spot that Mike Blake could never fit into with his massive truck. You leverage that you're busy when the door-to-door -door salesman comes and knocks on your door. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm busy right now, sorry. You leverage caller ID when they call you about your car's extended warranty, <laughs> right? You leverage your knowledge of the timing that the bridge goes up at Wrightsville to time your commute. Leverage. You are taking something, it can be anything, and using it to maximum advantage. This is what we want to look at today. What should leverage look like in the Christian life? We're going to be in Acts 16. So while you turn there, I'm going to tell you what we're going to see is we're going to see two men. We're going to see Timothy and we're going to see Paul. And we're going to watch them leverage aspects of their lives for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church. So I'm going to read for us Acts 16, 1 to 5 at the moment. Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So let's break this text down. Paul comes to town, and he finds a young man named Timothy. Timothy is described as a disciple. He's a believer. He's well spoken of. He's the son of a Jewish mother, and his father was Greek. And Paul sees something in Timothy that apparently catches his attention. And Paul wants to bring him along. And Timothy, apparently, is willing to come along and wanting to go with Paul. So Paul had Timothy circumcised, and then... Wait. <laughs> if you are familiar with the scriptures... You say, Paul did, Paul did what? Paul had Timothy circumcised. Wait, 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 wait. Paul. Paul, like Paul who wrote Galatians, Paul. Paul who in Galatians 5, 2 says, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Uh, wait, what? Paul had Timothy circumcised. Wait, Paul had Timothy circumcised... The same Paul who was fighting earlier in Acts 15, by the way, that's one page back, fighting with people who had said, oh, you have to be circumcised. I'm going to read Acts 15, 1 and 2. You can turn there if you want. It's one page back. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you, have, uh, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, by the way, that means angry yelling, <laughs> Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So the Paul who one chapter earlier had fought with people and said, no, 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 you don't have to be circumcised. When he comes and finds Timothy, he has him circumcised. What happened later in 15? Later in 15... In Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, as it becomes known, writes a letter that affirms that circumcision is not necessary for salvation. So what's going on here? 
Let's look again at chapter 16, verse 4. We just read it. And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. That's the decision of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. So Paul and Timothy are literally carrying a letter with them on their missionary journey stating, you don't have to be circumcised. What is going on here? How do Paul's actions fit with his teachings elsewhere? So here's what's happening. Paul and Timothy both understand that circumcision is irrelevant to salvation. It has nothing to do with saved or not saved. Much like baptism. Baptism has zero to do with saved or not saved. Now, if you're a believer, you should be baptized. That is a separate topic. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. I don't know. But it's not a salvific issue. What is happening here in this passage is Timothy is leveraging his rights. Timothy is leveraging his comfort. And he is leveraging his body. Timothy has every single right to say, I am not going to be circumcised. The Jerusalem council said, I don't need to be circumcised, so I'm not going to. And anyone who wants to argue with me, I have a letter here from the Jerusalem council that says, I don't need to be circumcised. (laughs) Of anyone in all of history who can say, I don't need to be circumcised. It's the guy who has the letter that says, I don't have to be circumcised, (laughs) right? And anyone in their right mind would say to Timothy, Timothy, that is totally reasonable. (laughs) You don't want to be circumcised? I don't blame you. Don't do it. But that's not what he does. Paul directs Timothy to be circumcised. And Timothy agrees to be circumcised and is circumcised. He lays aside his right for the sake of the Jews. For the sake of the people whom he's trying to reach. Talk about going outside your comfort zone. Right? He did the unnecessary. Because Timothy was willing to lay aside his rights for the sake of the gospel... Timothy had the opportunity, with the letter in hand that said he didn't have to be circumcised to be saved, to leverage his particular situation for the furtherance of the gospel. Timothy made sure that his previous state of being uncircumcised would not hinder the furtherance of the gospel and Paul's ministry. He was willing to leverage his comfort, his rights, for the sake of the gospel. But chapter 16 doesn't end there. In verse 12, Paul moves on to Philippi. And in Philippi, the scriptures indicate that Philippi is a leading city in Macedonia and is actually even a Roman colony. When they had been there a few days and they had connected with the fledgling church, Paul casts out a demon from a girl who was a fortune teller. She had been making her owners lots of money. And the scripture says in verse 19... But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. There are several important key points of information in this section. I'm going to tell you five of them. One, Paul did nothing wrong. Right? He didn't didn't do anything wrong. He cast a demon out of a girl. That's not a bad thing. Number two, Paul was brought before the magistrates. Number three, Paul was beaten by the magistrates. Four, 
Paul was thrown in jail. And five, just by way of reminder, Paul did nothing wrong. What are Paul's rights here? Well, whether you've read the Bible before or this is the first time, one right that he has is to feel a little bit angry. I did nothing wrong and you're beating me. Maybe, maybe he might even, we might argue he has the right to feel a little bit bitter about that. He could make sure that all of his fe- fellow prisoners know that he was being attacked wrongly and beaten for absolutely no reason. But that's not what we see from Paul. That's not what we see. He set aside his rights and he leveraged his situation. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Instead of demanding his rights, he leveraged his situation. He used it to maximum advantage. I know it's cliche, but he literally had a captive audience. He prayed and sang hymns to God, and the other prisoners, whether they liked it or not, were forced to listen. He was leveraging. God did not stop there, though, with his servant Paul. Verse 26 says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. It's a very reasonable presumption, right? All of a sudden, the earth shook. The chains fell off. The doors opened. I am sure that Paul is well aware of what had happened to Peter in Acts 12. Peter got thrown in prison, and an angel came and just took the chains off, opened the doors, and walked him out. So I'm sure Paul was thinking, well, I guess God's, God's letting me go. Okay. But then Paul noticed the jailer, and he decides to leverage his situation for the gospel. What does he do? Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And, they, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Paul had been praying and singing. He had been laying down his right to be angry and used the opportunity to share, even if indirectly, the truths of the gospel. Paul was then presented with unfastened chains and open prison doors. And instead of running for freedom, he leveraged his captivity for the sake of the gospel. I have to wonder, are we as vigilant as Paul? Are we as willing as Timothy to undergo discomfort for the sake of others? Are we willing to lay aside our rights and privileges for the sake of the gospel? Or do we justify our reasonable actions for that reason? Because they are reasonable. You realize it would have been totally justifiable and reasonable for Timothy to not be circumcised. It would have been totally reasonable and justifiable for Paul to just sit in his cell in silence. It would have been completely understandable if Paul had run out of the prison when your chains fall off miraculously and the doors pop open, right? Sometimes God opens the door. Sometimes he drops the chains off and slams the door open. But for the sake of the gospel, these men laid aside their right You know, it sounds almost like they're trying to emulate a glorious savior who set aside his rights and took the form of a lowly man and became obedient to the point of death, even death of a cross. It's as if these men are counting their lives as nothing for the sake of the one who bought them and delivered them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved 
son. Christian, your life is a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes. As Piper says, don't waste your life. Acknowledge your rights. Acknowledge your privileges and lay them down for the sake of your God and your king. But our text today does not simply show the abandonment of rights and privileges. I know that word is a buzzword and comes up a lot in our society, in the news, in social media, the concept of privilege. And they say you must abandon your privilege, you must abandon your privilege, get rid of your privilege. The scriptures doesn't, doesn't refer to it that way. The scriptures are calling you to lay aside privilege for the sake of the gospel. Absolutely. However, it also shows, it doesn't show just abandoning them. It shows leveraging them. Just throwing them away says, well, I, I have the advantage of a truck. And instead, I'm going to walk to Myrtle Beach. Why? Well, because someone else doesn't have a truck. That doesn't make any sense. Leverage your privileges, all of them. Sometimes that means handing the keys over to somebody else and say, hey, you can, you can have my spot or you can do this, you can do that. But it also includes the aspect of using it to maximum advantage. And we're going to see that in our text. Paul had the Philippian jailer return him to his cell. There's a couple reasons for this. Number one, if he didn't, the Philippian jailer would have been killed. But also, Paul's not done leveraging. So he had leveraged his rights. He didn't complain. He didn't run away. He had given up these things. But now we are going to see that Paul is going to leverage in the other way. Not giving up by asserting his privilege. Let's read in verse 35. But when it was day, the magistrate sent to the police, saying, let those men go. And the jailer, I'm assuming he's pretty excited about this, right? The jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said to them, oh, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. Do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. Uh oh. Paul had rights, he was Roman. When the magistrate sent to release Paul quietly, he refused to go. Paul had rights. He was privileged. By birth, he was a Roman citizen. Roman citizens had more privilege than the average person. The magistrates at Philippi would have been extremely aware of this. Their city was not a Roman city slash colony by being the fact that it was in Italy and an original colony. No, it had been granted the privilege of being a Roman colony. This was a massive privilege. They were treated like a true Roman city, even though they weren't. They were free from the tributes and taxes that other non-free cities, non-Roman colonies, had to pay. They had an autonomous government. They had legal ownership rights. But all these rights had been given to them. They were required to act like a Roman city as part of this privilege that they were given. And one of the many requirements of a Roman city involved treating Romans better than the average person. You could not beat a Roman without a trial. It was against the law. The magistrates had not known that Paul was Roman. They also didn't take time to ask him. They just beat him. But Paul knows all this too, and he knows it well, and he leverages the situation. Now we have to ask. So Paul has this information. He's got, he's got a, you know, a, a wild card, an, an ace that he could play and win. Why didn't he play it in verse 20? 
right? It wasn't, this wasn't that a, a crazy mob beat him and then the magistrate scoops him up and is like, well, what do we do with this bloodied body? I'll just throw it in prison for a while and figure out what happened. No, no, no. They specifically had chosen to beat him. One theory why he didn't bring this up earlier, and I think it's the most reasonable explanation, is that Paul knew that the fledgling church in Philippi was about to undergo persecution. The people were angry. They were going to take it out on somebody. And we saw it elsewhere in the scriptures, right? When they couldn't find Paul, they grabbed Jason and the guys in his house were like, oh, we're, we're going to take it out on these people. So Paul would rather have it be taken out on him. He would rather take that persecution in his own body with the ability to, to leverage his Romanness for the sake of the church in Philippi, and he did. By allowing himself to take the beating and the imprisonment, he was able to provide cover for the rest of the church in Philippi. Let's look what the magistrates, who had been the ones who had stripped him and ordered his beating, look how they react in verse 38. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. The magistrates were afraid. You bet they were. There was no one else to blame. Again, it wasn't just that the crowd had beat them and left this bloodied man on their doorstep. In verse 22, it said, the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. The ramifications, not only for the city, but for these particular men, was huge. Therefore, in verse 39, they apologize. That's true, that that word can mean apologize, but I think the force here is more accurately represented by pleaded. They apologized and pleaded with these men. They're saying, please, 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 please leave our city. <laughs> please, we're sorry, please, please. Because they want this man, this beaten Roman citizen, as far away from them as possible. Out of sight, out of mind, please go away. Please go away, please. What do you think was going to happen the next time one of these associates of Paul who stayed behind when, some, when they came in front of a magistrate? What's the first thing that comes to mind in the mind of the magistrate? Oh, I beat that guy. I beat that Roman. You know what? Let's just, let's just call it a day. Let's, you know, let's, let's not worry about this one. They're going to give the church a very wide berth at least for a while. And that's going to give the church in Philippi time to get roots, to grow in a protected state. Paul leveraged his own body and he leveraged his rights as a Roman and took that beating, then leveraged his rights as a Roman to protect the church. He is leveraging his rights. We must again ask, why did Paul do this? Why did Paul leverage his body for the rights and the sakes of others? Because he knew full well that someone else had leveraged his rights for him. 1 John 4.19 tells us that we love because he first loved us. Christ took a beating far worse than anything Paul could take. And so in light of that, easy decision. Christian, God loved you and sent his son to die in your place. The scriptures tell us, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We should lay aside our rights one year, a few years ago at Shepherd's Conference, I saw a man, they had a shoe shine station. These guys, they, they're there for hours, crouched down on their knees, shining shoes. And someone said to me, do you, you know who that guy is? I said, I don't know. He said, that is a superior court judge. Really? Yeah. And he spends, and he, oh, he's here every day. He's here every day, shining shoes of pastors. 
Why would a man of that? I mean, we have very little in our world anymore that has rank and stature and there's a handful of positions, but most, you know, we have this great, great equality here. But judges kind of stand above the, above the hoi polloi, right? Above, above the rest of us. And he's on his knees, shining shoes. He's leveraging his time and his rank for the sake of these men. I've watched as godly men and women have used and leveraged their influence and their affluence for the sake of the gospel. You know, I'll, I'll say it because he's, he's not in here. Mike Blake, when he went down to Ecuador, one, he's going down to Ecuador many, many times in his life for the sake of the gospel. But this last time, he had a meeting and he leveraged his position he had been a police officer and just retired from a career, being a career officer here. And he went down there and was able to leverage that position to have a meeting with the police force down there in the town where they're going and was able to share the gospel. He didn't leverage it for a free meal. He didn't leverage it for some guy to be like, oh, come out to dinner with us. He leveraged it so that he could get in front of countless law enforcement officers down there and share the gospel leveraging our rights, leveraging what we have been given. We must remember, what do we have that we have not been given? Why has God given you the job that he's given you? The freedoms, the money, the time, the skills, the relationships. Why has he given you those things? This life is not merely here for your comfort. Every good and perfect gift came down from the Father, whether you worked your tail off for it or whether it was handed to you on a silver platter. And you must leverage it, all of it, for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of service to our King. What answer will you give if the Father asks you, when you stand before him one day, what have you done with what I've given you? Will you say, Father, I religiously gave you 10% of every dollar I earned. That's right, 10 cents on the dollar. And not only that, God, I gave you three whole hours every week, Sunday morning. Three of them. Yep, out of, out of 168, I gave you three that's three more than some other people. And I shared the gospel with every single person that came up to me out of nowhere and said, do you know how I can possibly be saved? Shared the gospel with every one of them. I mean, you feel the discomfort of that, right? I do. I feel like it's a little bit too, too close to home. What about the other 90% of my money. Doesn't that belong to him too? How did I leverage that for the kingdom? Was my home that I paid on every month used to serve him? Was my car used for ministry purposes? Were my groceries? Was my entertainment? All of these and everything else can be and should be leveraged for the kingdom. What about those other 165 hours a week? Were they used for him? Do you treat your employment as though you work for God himself and he has happened to subcontract you out to whatever company it is that writes that paycheck? Are those countless hours, I'll repeat that, countless hours spent raising your kids, are those viewed as drudgery or are they viewed as an opportunity to disciple hearts and minds of image bearers of God? Does he own your me time or is that kind of off limits to him? Does he own all 168 hours or are they leveraged for his service? What about your relationships? Do you view every person you come in contact with as someone whom God wants you to influence? Are you discipling someone 
And are you being discipled? Are you building relationships with people that you otherwise wouldn't build relationships with, but you're doing it because you want to share the gospel with them? You are trying to get those gospel opportunities. Are you looking for every chance you can to share the good news? Are you thinking of others and encouraging them? Are you serving Christ by serving his bride? The scriptures remind us, believer, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your bodies. Christian, follow the example of Paul and Timothy as they followed Christ's example. Leverage what God has given you for the sake of service to your king. Now, if you are here today and you are not a Christian, you might be wondering, why would someone want this? Why would someone want to sacrifice for other people? Why would someone leverage everything they have and everything they are for some simple belief? It's because it's far more than a belief. Every single Christian in this room has looked at their own life. And you know what we've seen? We've seen sin. We have seen that we are not good people. Sure. You, you, you take a snapshot of our lives and you might say, that's a good person. Look, he, he opened a door for somebody. He's a, he's a nice person. He's not, you know, throwing things at people. He's generally a good, a good person. That's nice. Take a look at my heart. Every single Christian in this room knows that God has called us to be perfect and yet we are sinners. And each each cocktail of sin in our own heart looks different than someone else's. Yours has a little bit more of this. Mine has a little more of that. But you know what? It doesn't matter. We looked and said, I can't get to heaven like this. I stand as a rebel against almighty God and there is no hope for me. And then someone leveraged their time and their comfort and came and told each and every Christian in this room. No, no. Someone made a way for you. Someone is willing to pick up the tab. Someone is willing to trade places with you and take the judgment that you deserve. They leveraged the little bit that they had to, save, to help save me. And we do that for each other. And we want to do that for you. If you are not a Christian here, come talk to us. We want you to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came and lived a perfect life. The life that I should have lived and didn't. And he had 33 years of perfection that he lived so that he could take that 33 years and put it on my account. So when God the Father looks at me, he doesn't look and say, oh, Trevor plus Jesus, that's good enough to go to heaven. No, no, no. You put Trevor in the equation and it's, it's toast. The Father looks down and says, Jesus Christ, 33 years of perfection, that is good enough to go to heaven. And so I stand saved, not because of works of righteousness that I have done, but according to his mercy when he saved me. And he is willing to save you. He is willing to save anyone who calls on his name. So we look at this life and we look at the call to leverage our privileges and our rights and we say, those little things? If we look at it, if we look at the choice, it's an easy decision. It's an easy decision choice because we see not only our privileges, but also our pains. They are momentary and light compared to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. We resound as Christians with the famous quote from Jim Elliot, the missionary who died bringing the gospel to the indigenous people in Ecuador. He said, he is no fool 
who gives away, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Do do you hear that? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. This life, this privilege, these rights, you can't keep them. You have a lease on them that at max will last 90 years. And then it's gone. All of it. And it goes to someone else. Or just goes away. Or goes to the government. Right? You can't keep it. But to give up what you can't keep, to leverage, to leverage a bubble, the little child's blowing a bubble, to leverage a bubble for a bar of gold. Easy. All day long. To gain what we cannot lose. If that doesn't make sense to you, or if you just want to talk more about it, please, please come see me or anyone else in this room who loves Christ because we would love to talk to you. We would love to leverage our time and our comfort for the sake of your soul. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for your word Thank you for the record that we have of men and women throughout history who have loved you, who have given up their rights and their privileges for you, who have served you. And some of them, it has cost them their comfort, some their rights. Many, it has cost them their lives. And yet none of them have regretted it. Lord, I ask you that we would be a people who would gladly leverage those things that we can't keep, those momentary and light things for the sake of service to you, for the thing that will last. In your son's name we pray, amen.